So um, I work at the Hospital for Tropical Diseases, and um, over 100 years ago, uh, well, actually, originally it was a boat off the river in Greenwich, and then it moved into Greenwich on the mainland, the Siemens Hospital, and the sort of community the Hospital for Tropical Diseases served then was people, merchant navy and soldiers, etc., coming back from serving in the colonies. And uh, nowadays we are uh, in nice premises, part of University College Hospital just around the corner. Uh, and much as uh, the sort of uh, buildings, etc., have changed over that time, so is our population that we look after. So we're not really interested particularly in spending a lot of time worrying about backpackers, and people crashing through the undergrowth. We see plenty of that, and obviously they find us, and, and we do from time to time make interesting diagnoses in those people. But actually, a lot of our practice is about migrants. So, for example, if you look at our inpatient and outpatient data, roughly half of our patients are migrants. And if you look at some of our top diseases, most of our uh, malaria cases were born abroad, most of our TB, most of our HIV, all our leprosy, lots of our hepatitis, reflecting what you've heard in the course of today already. Um, and, you know, here, for example, is our, this is our walk-in clinic, and we've mapped where our cases come from. They come from all over London. They come from, in fact, all over the UK, particularly the southeast. And uh, they come from areas where there's high prevalence of migrants. These are some maps you may have seen, published actually in The Guardian many years ago, uh, showing different ethnic groups, but also reflecting uh, country of origin across the UK. So we do serve populations of high migrant density. And the question is, how good are we and how good can we be at making diagnosis early and improving outcome as a result from some diseases which are, uh, I think, and I will argue to you, of potentially quite important public health relevance. So the most important of all, of course, is malaria. But I'm not going to say a huge amount about it because post-travel diagnosis of malaria is pretty straightforward. And we can summarize as follows. First of all, if you've got a fever and you're, if you've got a patient who's got a fever and they've come back from uh, the tropics, they need to be tested for malaria. It's a very simple thing. It's followed generally well. In fact, my colleagues wrote up a paper in the BMJ uh, this year which correlated outcome from malaria with where in the UK you presented. And it made it fairly clear that if you present in areas where there's a lot of malaria, outcome is better. If you present in parts of the country where there's not much malaria, outcome is really significantly worse. And I'm sure that almost all of that is due to a delay in diagnosis in people coming back from abroad. So the message remains unchanged. If you've got a fever on return from the tropics, you should be tested for malaria, whatever other symptoms that you've got. Um, the other main, the much more knotty issue uh, about malaria is pre-travel, and that's knotty, and therefore I'm pleased to see that Claire Wong from Nathnak is going to take that on after tea, because how can we prevent malaria in our uh, groups who are visiting friends and relatives abroad? Yes, they have much lower mortality from malaria than our travellers, but actually they represent a much larger proportion of the cases, and some deaths from malaria in the UK are in migrants who are visiting friends and relatives abroad. It is not a disease of negligible uh, significance. What has changed for us in, in secondary and tertiary care is we've now got a drug that's much more effective, much lower mortality, and we now make sure that all patients with severe malaria get uh, intravenous artesanate, uh, which we provide to other hospitals, but increasingly a lot of hospitals around the country are getting their own supply. So we get uh, thousands of phone calls every year from other hospitals where uh, they say we've got a patient with malaria, what should we do? And we make an assessment about whether they have severe malaria and whether to ship some intravenous artesanate to them because we know they'll have better outcomes as a result. So that's all for now about malaria. Um, but we see a lot of other parasites and they present in all sorts of places, not necessarily in primary care, but here's an example. So uh, uh, an Indian chef who'd moved to the UK six months previously, and he presented with focal seizures proceeding to secondary generalization, and he had lesions in his brain. There's another patient with multiple lesions, and the diagnosis was made on the basis of the radiology and on the basis of a serological test. He had neurocysticycosis. Uh, it sounds obscure. It's the commonest cause of epilepsy in South Asia, 
and it's one of the commonest causes of epilepsy in South and Central America. It's an important disease. Now, this is going to be diagnosed because patients who are having a first seizure get investigated generally in secondary care, end up with a CT scan, and the diagnosis is made on that basis. So um, there's probably not a role for something like this for screening in primary care, not least because uh, unless uh, treatment is given under supervised circumstances, you might increase the rate of seizures. So I don't think there's a good argument at the moment for something like neurocystokosis that we see a lot of, that there's necessarily a benefit in earlier diagnosis and therefore in screening. Um, what's going on with cystocytosis? So it's a tapeworm. So this is a human tapeworm. So humans carry the tapeworm. There's one of these very long segmented worms and they defecate and uh, defecate and excrete the eggs in these segments into the soil. And what would normally happen in high prevalence settings is pigs or cattle would eat the grass that's infected with these eggs and then they develop into cysts in the muscle. And then when, where the abattoir facilities are not very good, the food then re-enters the food chain and humans get infected with the tapeworm. But what can happen is uh, the human with the tapeworm might defecate the segments and then someone who doesn't wash their hands properly might pick up the eggs on their fingers from the environment and then those cysts think they're developing in a pig but they're actually developing in a human and that's neurocystosicosis. So it can be as common in Muslim or Jewish populations and there's some very famous outbreaks uh, described, for example, in the Orthodox Jewish community in New York where it was the Filipino nanny who had the tapeworm and all the kids by fecal oral root contamination got the neurocystosicosis. So everyone's at risk. Don't think that people can't have this just because they, are, they don't eat pork. Uh, here's another sort of similar sort of exciting case that comes our way. This is a chap from Romania who collapsed in a nightclub in Slough after vigorous dancing. <laughs> and, uh, and he was hypertensive with urticaria and wheeze. And of course, uh, people didn't think of hydatid disease when they first saw him. They thought that it must be drugs. And he had a very marked eosinophilia, but he also complained of abdominal pain and was then found to have this big cyst, which you might be able to see has collapsed. It's leaked. And he had an antibody test confirmed that he had a high datted cyst. And what, the thing about worms is they hide their antigens in this very non antigenic coat. And when it leaks and gets burst, all of a sudden the host immune system is exposed to these antigens that can cause anaphylaxis. <coughs> so that's how he presented to us. Now, if you work in Slough, please don't ref investigate and refer every patient who collapses in a nightclub. <laughs> by which I mean, sorry, by which I mean is that this is another disease that uh, is probably not ideal for screening or diagnosis in primary care, partly because these tests only become positive after it's leaked. And by the time it's leaked, the patient's presented to hospital because they're unwell. And also, we have hundreds of patients on our books with uh, high data disease from all parts of the world. But again, earlier diagnosis is probably not going to be associated with better outcome because treatment is difficult enough even if diagnosed early, because getting drugs into this and surgical management is all very complex. And as I said, the tests are often negative. So yes, these are not uncommon in people from the Balkans uh, and various other parts of the world, but it's probably not the sort of thing that you need to change your practice in primary care about. What's going on here? It's similar. This is about worms getting into the wrong host. So this is a dog tapeworm and the dogs defecate these segments, and then the sheep eat them, and they develop into cysts in the sheep, and the sheep dies, and the dog eats the sheep, and that's the cycle. But if a human, uh, by contamination of the grass and soil, gets those eggs, then they think they're developing in a sheep, and the human gets high datted cysts. And when they burst, they can not only cause anaphylaxis, but they've got little daughter cysts inside them, which can then rupture and multiply throughout the abdomen. And this is a woman who came in and we thought she had ovarian carcinoma, but actually this was high datted cyst. So we see it a lot in people from Turkey, Iran, the Balkans, Kenya, and we still have some sheep farmers from Wales from time to time. <laughs>
So again, prevalent, don't really know what the answer is for you guys in primary care. Here's another example. So those were both worms, and this is not a worm, this is a protozoa. A 55-year-old Bolivian man with heart failure and altered bowel habit. And what's happened is he's grown up in these sort of circumstances where they have these reduviate bugs living in the uh, walls of the hut that then uh, sort of by a complex um, sort of uh, vomiting, injecting route end up introducing trypanosomiasis, American trypanosomiasis into the bloodstream and it causes heart failure and it causes mega esophagus and mega colon. And again, this is not an unimportant thing from a public health point of view. It's one of the commonest causes of heart failure in South America, Chagas disease. But by the time you've got heart failure, there's probably no benefit in treatment. The damage is done. So how do we identify people early enough where the treatment, which is pretty horrible, is actually going to be useful? And how good are we at detecting those people? So if you look at this sort of ONS data about movement of South Americans, we can estimate that probably, given that this is a predominantly, this is a South American disease, there are probably about 80,000 cases of Chagas disease in Europe, of which 99% in the UK are undiagnosed. Um, and um, the issue about that is if you do pick people up who haven't yet got heart failure but are infected, treatment is associated with better outcome. And what's happening now in the National Blood Transfusion Service, people from South America being screened, and we're getting a lot of people who've been found to have positive serology through the National Transfusion Service, and the particular, and, and they come to us and there's a lot of discussion about treatment or not, but the particular area where the UK is going to go quite soon and needs to work out how to do that is uh, antenatal care, because South American women with Chagas disease, it has major implications for the, uh, for the baby. And so we do need to think about how we're going to target um, South American women and screen antenatally to improve outcomes. And we haven't really worked that out. And I'm sure there's some role in primary care in certain areas towards sorting that out. So those are diseases which are quite knotty to deal with because they're not ideal for screening. They do come up quite often. Our tests aren't brilliant. The treatment's not always straightforward. But I'm going to spend most of the rest of the session talking about one disease which I think is quite different from many of those perspectives. And I'll tell you how I got into that. When I was uh, in my final year as a registrar and I had to do a de general medicine clinic, I found myself in a general gastrointestinal clinic uh, a few years ago. And I saw one patient after another who'd been in secondary care for a year or two having lots of expensive cycles of investigations for their non-specific gastrointestinal symptoms. And by the time I saw them, they'd had you know, two colonoscopies and an MRI of the bowel and a CT of their pancreas and lots and lots of things going on. And all I did was look at their absolute eosinophil count on their full blood count differential and found eight who were born in Africa or Asia who had an eosinophilia. And what does an eosinophilia mean to an infection specialist? Well, we know from the hospital tropical diseases that when we get referred people with an eosinophilia, in 50% of them we make a diagnosis of a parasitic infection. And when we make a diagnosis, of those we diagnose, we find schistosomiasis in about a third, we find strongyloidiasis in about a third, we find various filarial infections and various gut helminths. So as an infection doctor, eosinophilia in someone who has traveled, who has ever traveled, means a helminth infection, a worm infection. So, and that's been uh, worked up quite well by my colleagues, which is that if we have a strategy whereby we do this simple package of testing, which I've put in the leaflet that's gone round, um, then of the 30 cases in whom we make a diagnosis of a parasitic infection, we'll make 29 of them on the first time they come to clinic. And what that means is doing stool microscopy for overcysts and parasites and strongyloides serology, and we're able to do a specialised strongyloides culture, which is not widely available. If you're in Africa, if you've been, that's if you've been anywhere in the tropics. If you've been in Africa, you need to do that, but we also need to do tests for schistosomiasis and probably tests for filaria. 
And if you've been in West Africa, there's some additional filarial tests that we sometimes do. Now, if the only thing that you take away from that is, if someone's got an eosinophilia, uh, check them out for, do a serological test for strongyloides, I'll be really pleased and I'll explain why. So, for example, in that clinic, I found of those eight people, uh, five of them were found to have strongyloides, and I'll show you the further results of that. That's all written up in a, in a journal of infection guideline, which, uh, and the details of that are also in the migrant health guide, and I, I think in the handouts that you've got, saying a relatively simple strategy for investigating a raised absolute eosinophil count, and please look at the absolute eosinophil count uh, in people who have ever traveled. Um, so I'm going to talk about strongyloides and why that's important. So we see strongyloides from wherever we see people who've been traveling anywhere across the tropics. Okay. And where have people been exposed? It's people walking around barefoot. This is Uganda, this is Bangladesh, in poor sanitary conditions where the worms are living in the, so in the soil and they're looking for some human skin to crawl through. And we also know from my colleagues' work that of people, that travelers are slightly different from migrants in terms of what tests are positive. But if you've ever, the take-home point from this is if you're a migrant and you have strongyloides, you will be found to be positive by a serological test. So sometimes travelers don't yet have a positive antibody test. But if you're uh, a migrant and you've got strongyloides, it's a simple antibody blood test will be positive. And you'll also note that they didn't all have eosinophilia. In fact, that's probably an overestimate. So what? So what? So people have eosinophilia. Maybe they've got a worm infection. Does it matter? Well, there are various reasons why it matters. One, potentially, is that it may be a cause of gastrointestinal symptoms. So were all those patients that I was seeing in the gastro clinic who had strongyloides, was it the cause of their nonspecific gastrointestinal symptoms? As infection tropical doctors, we're very familiar with a patient with strongyloides who have lots of GI symptoms, and we definitely, we're very confident that there are patients who have those symptoms. But various studies have varied when they've looked at their case series in answering the question of whether uh, people with chronic strongyloides infections do have gastro symptoms or not, whether their symptoms are due to the infection or not. Um, often they're very sort of mild, heartburn, abdominal pain, bloating. Uh, certainly in 40% of our HDD cases had some of those symptoms. So there seems to be potentially something going on there. It is a soil, an intestinal helminth after all. When I investigated these patients, found them to have strongyloides, treated them with ivermectin, um, uh, their eosinophilia resolved, and they certainly reported uh, that their symptoms had got better, but that wasn't a really very uh, thorough way, and the numbers are very small. So we wanted to take that a bit further, and uh, uh, colleagues of mine worked with me to do that, and we systematically, uh, over a period of time, screened all migrants in the gastro clinic who had eosinophilia, and found that 40% of them had helminth infections, and when we treated them, in basically all of them, their eosinophilia resolved. And again, with the sort of uh, rather vague questions about their symptoms or reading the case notes, it appeared that all of them reported some uh, or uh, a lot of improvement in their symptoms. So that could be a placebo effect, it could be unrelated, but certainly looking for strongyloides in the people and treating them was associated with um, them reporting an improvement in their GI symptoms at their next clinic appointment. Some had presented with dyspepsia, some with diarrhea, uh, mainly strongyloides, but we saw some schistosomiasis and some trichuris, and they came from all over the world. So, how long ago is the travel that is important? Well, this is, uh, these, this is, these are not migrants at all, really. These are Far East prisoners of war. So these were British troops who were captured by the Japanese and had to work on the Thai Burma Railway in the 1940s, and they were diagnosed in the 1980s with strongyloides. So nearly 40 years after they'd been anywhere where they could have acquired strongyloides, they, many of them were found to not only have strongyloides, but then become quite sick with it. And why did they become sick with it? Because if someone has chronic strongyloides, and they are then immunosuppressed, and it can be just with a short course of steroids, 
then they can get very sick because the bugs disseminate and they start spreading through the gut and appearing in the lung and you get gram-negative se sepsis and necrotizing pneumonias. And that's very unusual. We only see a case of that a year, a couple of cases a year. And you're all thinking how many migrants you give steroids to for their COPD. So there's something missing there. Clearly, this is severe and nasty and entirely preventable because it's easy to diagnose with a serological test and easy to treat with a single course of, of uh, anti-helminthics. But uh, clearly, the hits are mul multiple. It's not, not everybody who has chronic strongyloides gets this disease. So this is important. And some US health economics analyses in the England Journal said, because of this very rare uh, outcome, all migrants should be presumptively treated with anti-helminthics, and there's been some ongoing work on that. So it is of public health and potentially health economics relevance to treat, if not to screen, which is not entirely uh, without cost. Um, but it does translate into uh, guidelines for people who look after people who they're going to immunosuppress. For example, these are the guidelines for managing inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, say that you should screen people for strongyloides, and similarly haematologists and rheumatologists do. Uh, the same group, Phil Smith and us and others, looked and found that uh, among migrants in that inflammatory bowel disease clinic, we found 15% uh, or so had strongyloides. So there's quite a lot going on, in, even in that, uh, that very at-risk group. Um, just moving on. So I've talked quite a lot about secondary care. What about in primary care? Uh, so some screening studies among refugees in Canada from Southeast Asia found that more than 70% of people from Cambodia and Laos had strongyloidiasis. What about in parts of East London where there's large South Asian communities, for example? And uh, is this something that's going to be fairly straightforward to sort out? Because the drugs are pretty effective and they're not that expensive when we talk about antiretrovirals and and TB drugs and hepatitis drugs, these are one-off doses that are not that expensive and are very effective. So we've been doing a study, and I'm going to show you some early results of that. And we asked the question in a, a, a practice in Brick Lane and then Jubilee Street practice around the corner, what's the prevalence of strongyloides among Bangladeshi migrants in London? Do we only see it in people of a certain age? Uh, does eosinophilia have predictive value for strongyloides in this setting? And is infection associated with GI morbidity? So the GPs there said to us, oh, it would be great if we could find something we can offer to all our patients who come repeatedly with nonspecific GI symptoms. It's a real problem for us and for them. And maybe this would be something that we'd like to know. And maybe we could also reduce our referrals to secondary care by uh, excluding strongyloides first. So we looked for over a course of a year. We found all patients with eosinophilia. We found all patients with unexplained GI symptoms. Uh, we're just finishing off uh, uh, looking at a control group of people having full blood counts through the phlebotomy service in the local practice. We take a bit of blood. We do a brief questionnaire on where, what their travel history is and their GI symptoms. We collate it with their GP data on, on prescribing of steroids, et cetera, and on demographics. Uh, the team have applied some prompts to EMIS so that it comes up when the GP sees the patient and saying, oh, could you please refer this patient on? But when the GPs, like all of you are, are too busy to do that, then it's been followed up with a letter and then a phone call to the patients. And we've had pretty good uh, penetration in terms of getting the majority of patients with eosinophilia and the majority of patients with nonspecific GI symptoms into our study. Uh, a brief questionnaire asking them about, which is based on a, a Helsinki um, inflammatory uh, irritable bowel syndrome questionnaire to get a sense of what their symptoms are. And this is the data, the preliminary results over the last year from our study, where we showed, for example, so we found um, of the patients we recruited, about half were those with eosinophilia, or half were those with GI symptoms, a few had both. Um, and essentially what we found so far is that of patients with eosinophilia, 33% had strongyloides infection. Of the patients with GI symptoms, non-specific GI symptoms, uh, over 15%, had strongyloides infection, and we're currently establishing what the rate is in controls to tell us whether it's higher in these patients with GI symptoms than in uh, roughly matched uh, patients who do not, are not presenting with those symptoms. So uh, I don't have answers for you from that point of view to tell you whether you should be going and screening all your patients for 
uh, with eosinophilia for strongyloides infection. Uh, the risk of them going on to develop severe disseminated infection is very low, but it's not non-existent. Is it a cause of their symptoms? Is it causing their gastrointestinal symptoms? We don't know yet, but hopefully this study will start uh, getting us towards answering that question and tell us whether it's a useful thing to look for in people from the tropics with uh, GI symptoms, or is it only useful in those who happen to have eosinophilia as well? I don't think that's all there is to say about worm infections, because I think there's another whole area that's received a lot of interest in uh, people who work in this area. And that's the question is, what, what's the effect of worms on other infections? So worms generate this branch of the immune system, your type 2 and your regulatory T cells. Uh, that's, that's what worms tend to do. Um, things like HIV and TB and malaria need this type 1 branch of the immune system to control them. And we know from the lab that having strong regulatory and type 2 immune responses uh, suppresses your ability to, produce, to generate a good immune response to those things. And, you know, look at parts of the world where there's a lot of helminth infection, same parts where there's a lot of TB, same parts where there's a lot of HIV. Is that just related to uh, indices of poverty, et cetera, and environmental factors, or is there some uh, interaction within that? Uh, my uh, colleagues and then myself looking in a high prevalence TB cohort in Uganda found that the strongest predictor, so when we're thinking about, you know, we know that there's a lot of uh, latent TB infection and then the question is which of those people go on and develop active TB. The strongest predictor in a high prevalence TB cohort of going on to develop active TB was having a raised eosinophil count. So does having worm infection actually make you more likely to progress from latent TB to active TB? We don't know the answer to that, but we're, among other people, doing a study where, for example, we're diagnosing people with worm infection, seeing whether they have uh, um, latent TB infection, seeing whether there's effect of worm infection on their immune response, and then seeing when we deworm them, does it improve their anti-TB immune response. So we talked about strongyloides as rarely causing severe manifestations, possibly causing a high burden of GI symptoms, but is it also contributing to the burden of some of these other diseases we've been talking about today, like TB and HIV, et cetera? That's all. Thanks very much.